All right, guys, we got a special uh, deal here for you today. We are at Pete Mayna's house, and we got a special guest. We are going to talk a little bit about some of the hot topics in the industry today. Um, we're going to be doing that a bunch in some upcoming videos, and we got a real special guest with us today. I'm going to let Pete introduce who we got, and we're going to be talking about forward-facing sonars. It's really been a hot topic, and we feel like the two guys that we got here to talk about it... Um, will give you some insight, uh, their insights, and uh, it, by no means is it uh, trying to hammer anybody in the industry or anything like that. We're just trying to educate you guys um, going forward and bring you the best possible content and have some good debate about it. Debate. It's a debate. Did you say debate? It's kind of like a debate. Yes, and so this is what musky fishermen do in the winter. They talk about musky fishing. Now, Dave has alluded to the fact that possibly we could uh, be controversial here a little bit talking about some of these topics, but actually somewhere over the last summer, fall, you know, I was talking to Dave about how there's certain things that always get talked about in boats, but generally don't get talked about on social media. You know, some of the topics that nobody wants to get anybody upset in a lot of cases. But these are things that actually very seriously need to be talked about. And uh, I have here with me Scott Keeper, uh, who basically is uh, in the same area that I've started my guide career. i uh, been doing it just about as long. He's not quite as old as me, but uh, he's absolutely hardcore absolutely not afraid to say what he's thinking and a tremendous angler I, I would think over at least the last couple of decades here i don't think anybody else i know of in, in in this area has caught as many trophy fish put big fish in the boat as scott has he's hardcore and you know he's got opinion he definitely got opinions and he definitely knows the area and uh you know the 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 situations and that's why he's here and willing to talk about it so I'm looking forward to it. By the way, this is not, Scott and I don't communicate a whole lot, so this is, this is definitely not something that we would call stage. No, this is going to be our first sit-down uh, discussion about this topic, and like you said, I think this is an important one that the entire community of anglers that we love so much uh, and share these resources with, I think everybody needs to have this discussion right now. I don't think there's going to be any more important or pertinent time to have this discussion, so... Um, as controversial as it may be sometimes, that's what's missing all across the spectrum in every conversation now, is a good sit down discussion. Um, people don't want to talk anymore and that's what we need to do. Absolutely. So, you know, each one of us have different kind of viewpoints on this and... True. Uh, we're going to shed light, try to shed light on all of it. Um, and the good, the bad, all of it. So, I think without further ado, you know, with the with the forward-facing sonar um why don't you give us some of your insight it's actually a huge topic i, I just want to start off the first by saying that the uh you could call it the grumpy old man side of me or whatever you want overall uh the forward-facing sonar to me has like gone too far i wish it would have never come out uh, I have sponsors that make amazing electronics products, so, you know, hopefully they're not pissed at me by saying this, but, uh, you know, to, to some degree, to me, it's taken all of the mystery out of it uh, anymore. So I just want to start off by that. Personally, I, I say that I don't like it and can honestly say I wish it would have never come out. Then again, I'll also say that... Uh, I don't know, I guess I'm a capitalist and I appreciate good products that made things easier in a lot of ways. So I usually have very definitive opinions and I feel like I, uh, you know, it's usually pretty black and white, most topics that I, that I get involved with. But on this one, it's not, it's a, it's a hard one because there's so many different sides of it. The one thing that I will say that I've, I'm sure Scott would agree with is that the hard part is once it's out there and we're in a situation of I guess to a certain extent as anglers you've got ego uh, 
when you've got business involved, it could be producing products, it could be guiding, it could be all these different things. And the technology is uh, to the point, especially in certain situations, open water and different situations, you, you will do a lot better uh, catching fish, basically seeing fish, if you, you're using this technology compared to other people who don't use the technology. So once the technology starts getting used, you have the whole idea that other people are going to try and keep up. Uh, and you could argue that maybe they need to, to some degree, to try and keep up. So that's the hard part about all of it. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, I know Scott uh, sees it. I, I know that you definitely, I've heard, are against it. If I, I, if I saw some applications for it that I thought even resembled fishing when it's in use, <laughs> I, I might actually not be so against it. But I've always used the analogy since its conception and since it was released a few years back that it's, it's like going deer hunting with your truck and an infrared scope in the middle of the night. You're not going to know the deer is there 100 yards off the road, 50 yards off the road, 200 yards off the road, unless your infrared tells you it's there. Now you can start popping shots through the trees at and maybe you connect, maybe you don't. But without having any prior knowledge that that fish is even there before your electronics tell you it's there, I don't think it's just a little bit unjust to refer to it as fishing. I think we're in real danger of losing what it means to be an angler and to fish for these fish themselves. Um, I, I see guides in certain regions, whether it be Green Bay, some of the big Minnesota waters, where guiding now has become driving around, you cast at however many marks a day the guide can put you close to, you throw 50 casts, and that's your success for the day. And, and unfortunately, the more people like myself and some others complain about the technology, we see people digging their heels in on the FFS side and puffing their chest out and talking about how few casts a day it took to produce this many. We see guides out there telling their clients in advance, you won't cast at a fish under 45 inches today because it's become so accurate that you can actually gauge the size of your fish through the electronics and know what you are targeting. Um, I'm gonna reference this briefly because it was a big social media hoopla this fall. There were some anglers up on Eagle Lake, saw a fish on their FFS with a bait hanging out of the side of its face that had been broken off from another angler, went back, reported to the lodge, came back the following morning we were able to pull right back up on that fish, snag that fish, and remove that lure from its face. Now, really? we're bringing in an entire, entirely different area here of ethics when we come into the discussion of what the FFS is capable of doing for the angler, in quotes. And I use that very cautiously these days. Um, again, this to me comes back to the threat of losing to me what is the most purest about this fish in the sport that you accumulate time on the water, you accumulate knowledge about this beautiful beast we love so much, and we go out and we get it. We earned it. Part of the work is part of our craziness. We all share and love so much about each other. And now this tool has come up that's really dividing the sport. And it's dividing it in a very unpleasant way in a lot of discussions where people who used to get along well won't even speak to each other anymore. It's almost like politics to musky fishing now. Yeah. So with that, Pete, what I mean, that was he, he's got a point, it's well he's got stated, a really well stated point. And um, I, I've been in the boat with a couple guys who've had it and got in or I got a chance to see it in operation. And I, I think one of the things that I can say to it is a little bit of what Scott was talking about. I feel like you you have to be good in order to understand it as well, the, the actual. It's not like you can just go out there and pick it up the tool and go, you're going to go out and catch big fish. I mean, the guys that I did see using it were were hardcore guys like us. And um, I would say that, you know, they, they, they could see these fish in certain locations a lot easier than other, other spots like um, on breaks of uh, sand versus versus rock and um, when they were on the rocks you couldn't see them so that that technology wasn't working in them circumstances and from what I hear 
from some of the guys that use it quite often is if their fish are in the weeds, you're not going to see them. Um, I mean, you're going to have the advantage of the follow, and you know that that fish came, so you probably would come back and, and check that fish out later on down the road. And, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons of this whole thing, and we want to kind of share both. Um, I, I think what Scott said was very well stated, and we come from a time, I think is what we got to all understand too, is we come from a time when... Um, we were out there dropping buoys on things in order to indicate certain uh, certain spots and things like that and um lining up trees man that was the best actually. absolutely that's <laughs> right so it really gave us an advantage um back in that day when you were hardcore and really gave it your all it was your advantage and then they came out with the gps's and they were really good and i mean guys who never fished before could could fish but i mean some of it too is you also want that um to make people more safe on the water uh for one uh, safer on the water I, I would say um and it's we all use it we love it using gps and things like that and, and i mean but there's got to be i guess that's kind of the point we're all talking about here is what's the cutoff when you can actually visualize the fish well that's a, that's the hard thing yeah and 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 that's where i had to look at myself you know my initial reaction is it's too much i hate it i wish it would have never come around uh but i have to be perfectly honest with myself i was okay with sonar and you know some of the advancements so uh, personally, you know, you, you really got to look at it. In, in reality, uh, to me, fishing would be the absolute best if you had no maps at all of any kind and you could go jump on. I, I love that. I, I, I miss the old days of that kind of stuff. I'm right there with you. I yeah. would take it back to the basic conception of <laughs> circular paper graphs. I mean, in all honesty, what more do you need than depth and water temp? Uh, I mean, it's nice to know where bait fish are and all, but once you understand a body of water, even in its basic form, you can adapt and move yep. around as you need to. And let's be honest, uh, a lot of the lakes that we're the most concerned with and that this is being used on sometimes in what we question as appropriate ways are very small bodies of water that we enjoy around here, most of them under a thousand acres. We have so yeah. few bodies of water that are actually over a thousand um, that we are probably looking at this from a little bit smaller spectrum than we would if we were on some of those bigger hundred thousand acre or bigger lakes that some of the minnesota waters comprise um you know just to kind of go back to what dave was talking about and the advancements in technology yeah there's certain parts of this that do make our time on the water easier in terms of breaking down a lake or understanding structure etc but when i from the back of the boat can look at my three four five screens around me these days it's gotten just absolutely ridiculous tell you I need you to cast at this perfect angle in this degree the fish's face is right here you landed 10 feet past it okay it's coming with you speed up speed up speed up now jerk it once jerk it jerk it jerk it she's on you jerk it again that's not fishing you wouldn't even know the fish was out there following your lure for goodness sake and now you got somebody telling you and coaching you every foot of your retrieve to the boat on what to do with this fish I'm all about teaching people to trigger. I gave up my teaching career, everything I worked for in life so I could teach people this fish and how to catch it more effectively. But again, what are you actually learning when the video game play-by-play -play is all you learn and all you fish by? We're, that, again, this comes from the soul and the heart for me. I don't want to see people yeah. forget how to musky fish because technology makes it so easy. And I get the appeal. I want to be open and frank. That's why you asked me in here. We got a generation and a half, two generations deep of people being given blue ribbons for every act of mediocrity all across society. Because we can't tell anybody anything critical anymore to improve what they may have done recently. The, the idea of striving for greatness or getting better at anything has just been eliminated by society itself. Everybody wants the fast easy. Give me the fast easy. Right. Give me the fast sure. easy. Yeah. And unfortunately, in our business with some of the inflated egos that exist out there in the musky world i've watched it happen to some of the best anglers in across the entire game 
They said they wouldn't do it before they started seeing some of their clients catching fish that they weren't catching. They started seeing the guy on the same lake catching. And what do these guys do? Their ego, even though they're great sticks, really good at this game, their ego puts that FFS on the boat, puts it on the side of the boat, puts it on this side of the boat, so they can puff that chest out and feel like they're back in the place that they need to be, which is a step ahead of everybody else. It's a weird sport that way. You know it's always been that way. It's part of the culture of muskie, but that that part of the culture of muskie was because of the specialness of getting that fish, getting that big strike, and you earned that. That's what made that special. I don't look at these FS fish and see special. I see a video game, and that's that's all it is to me. I mean, I'll sit at home and play my old 1980s bass crank game, for God's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hear you. Just just real quickly, I don't I don't think you ever heard this. I know Dave has. My big uh, grumpy old man moment with technology was uh, Mille Lacs Rocks. Uh, I, I had, Gillespie will tell you this, I had six years of, there was never another muskie angler on the rocks on Mille Lacs. Everybody was fishing the weeds. The vast majority of the muskies were in the weeds. And anyway, it was before the mapping came mm-hmm. out. So mm-hmm. I, I knew what... And then that mapping came out, boy, it was like, because I had so many, you know, you understand, oh, yeah. so oh, many yeah. hours in it. And all of a sudden, that map was literally better than me, mm-hmm. just overnight, if somebody's got $200. And now that hummingbird absolutely probably hates me. <laughs> the technology is wonderful, but that actually is bringing me to the point of what the uh, reality of this stuff is is that uh you know un- unfortunately i don't see how we get rid of it at this point i mean the only fair way to do it would be to have these companies agree to end it on their own because financially it would be you know a total disadvantage to any other company or or it gets outlawed i don't know if i've never been big on that whole idea but but I mean, uh, it's a it, it's a tough one with regard to uh, fish survival for different reasons. Obviously, Scott, there's going to be way more people with uh, minimal skills. Let's say I don't mean to have it sound degrading, but they're you know they're going to be able to they're going to be able to find fish. Obviously, way better. And I, as you have pointed out, know exactly where they are and they're moving and reacting and all these different things. So. There's going to be a lot more fish getting caught. There already has been. Absolutely. You know, we, we, Absolutely. So. 100% agree. Right. Yep. So can can the fisheries, be, between the topic of how many more fish are being caught uh, than would have been otherwise, period, no matter how you look at this issue, a certain percentage of those, to some degree, even if they're not overhandled, are going to eat baits, bad, bleed out, whatever. Can our fisheries through more pressure on the fish period more more captures but also more education because they're seeing way more baits than they ever would have before with the same amount of people just because of this technology now now granted the side imaging is tremendous you can literally see fish and obviously you can see fish on sonar but this this is a whole new level a whole different ball game to uh literally allow people to put baits on fish's heads all the time so that to me at at the end of the day you know what the 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 fisheries are finite our our stocking at least for now is finite uh you know the the reality is one thing when i've tried to get people interested in fish handling i said the most important thing you could possibly do to catch more and bigger fish is get good at handling them because at the end of the day all of our egos and all of this other stuff aside you're only as good as the fishery you're fishing you can't catch fish that aren't there absolutely yeah and 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 and, you know that's that's what we really need to be focused on the most is can our fisheries handle this and i don't care if we're going to talk about a couple hundred acre lake down the road from here to our five and a half thousand acre, you know, biggest natural lake or the flowage, whatever. I don't care if we want to talk about the big lakes in Minnesota because there's a finite level of pressure that those fish can indulge as well. I look at our small lakes and I think about how long it takes our Wisconsin strain to grow. And I see this technology and how aggressively it's used against these fish. These fish start to learn what lures are 
as soon as they hit that low 30 inch stage and they get the bucktails and the top waters and the cranes and the tiny little candy baits in their face that they always see and they eat them willingly. But our Wisconsin fish, which is why it's always so difficult, the reputation of our big fish being inaccessible so much is because they do learn what baits are, boat presence are, and they are certainly learning what this massive amount of lateral line interference coming from our transducers are. They were showing it from our basic sonar already, the adult fish were. As we had a small discussion before we got going, we're seeing our juvenile fish not reacting to lures at all anymore. Like, are they even here? They're there. Mm -hmm. They're becoming so conditioned to the sonar output on our small bodies of water that there is a resistance ingrained to them almost as much so as getting that hook from that particular lure in the corner of their mouth would tell them, don't do that again. And we all know this. We all see the posts on social media of the people talking about, oh, we had 26 follows on meat today and not one would pick up. They come in and they show their video that they took on their phone. They sweeps yeah. up and swings away, sweeps up and swings away. And it's as soon as they get into that interference field, they're like, ah, that's gonna <laughs> hurt. And you know that's what's happening. And you see this across the entire musky world while this tool is being used. And again, we need to ask ourselves back to that idea of mortality, excessive fish handling, people able to get into their faces more and more and more. And the greatest mortality in our small waters is certainly handling and overhandling. Um, and like you were alluding to, it's not fair to say that the novice angler who's just getting into the sport and hasn't had umpteen releases isn't going to do as good a job at getting down into the neck through the gill plate to cut a hook when necessary. Nobody is great at surgery when they start in this. And if somebody out there wants to say they are, they can tune out right now because we all know we start somewhere in that mm -hmm. release game and we get better as we go along. We only get so many fish put into these small lakes that we're talking about. Wisconsin strain takes 20 years at minimum to get into that upper 40 inch to 50 inch range even to get to that special size, to overcome just what they needed to prior was almost impossible for our fish to get there with the lights in their eyes in the spring spawning time and the handling that they do receive. So I hope people understand that when we have this discussion that we have genuine concern for the future of musky fishing in oh, Northwest man. Wisconsin right now. This isn't just, hey, we don't like the technology being used. We don't. But these are the reasons we don't. We're looking at a couple years out right now with our minimal stocking we receive in these small acreage waters before stuff like this is really catching up with everybody. You and I are talking about the difficulties of getting low to mid 30 inch fish to respond on certain bodies of water anymore that normally would eat anything that flew by them with a hook on it in prior years. And this is most certainly this technology coming into play and causing this resistance in these fish. Pressure's up since COVID, we can acknowledge that as well. But the use of the electronics and giving everybody the map to the exact position and exactly where the face of that critter is pointing is impacting our fisheries and the health of our musky population, for sure. Yeah, I think, you know, Pete, uh, we've talked about this in the boat plenty of times. Uh, I, I don't know where Scott stands on this. I've always been an advocate of I like to bump a fish every now and then. You you and I have this and we talk about it all the time. And with the forward facing sonar stuff, I mean you you make some really good points on now more than ever it's it is um, super crucial and important to take care of the fishers because they're not stocking the amount and in the amount of fishermen that are coming in to this whole thing. Um, the whole thing just doesn't add up for a great recipe. And so uh, the thing is, is that we gotta, um, you, we do gotta take care of the fish. And I mean, I think I'll let you turn it over to you and why you want to see less handling of the fish and, and less bumping. Yeah, well that one's, uh, you know, pretty simple to me. I, and, and I'm going to uh, blame this probably mainly on, on social media uh, that's that's really taken off, uh, you know, in the last couple decades, especially the most recent. And it's how, uh, you know, a, a lot of, I guess, anglers express themselves. But at the end of the day, uh, the thing that receives the most likes and attention on social media is hold-up photos. And 
apparently too, I don't necessarily think it should, but exact sizes as well. So uh, photos are something that I've done for years, but photos are not good for fish either. Unless the fish is in the water, uh, any time a fish is out of the water is a bad deal for the fish. And the longer it's in possession period is, is you know, something stressful. Obviously, it's not swimming around, or around in a weed bed like it should be. But the, uh, the advent of the bump boards, and, and it's not even so much the bump boards themselves, it's in the boat. Uh, that's the problem. It's, it's extra handling. It's obviously, if it's in the boat, it's timed completely out of the water. Uh, unless they were in an actual live well in there. But uh, it's, it's time out of the water and it's extra handling. And the thing about it, I stopped personally measuring fish in the boat. Uh, I did that for years in my guide career. Uh, it was uh, 33 years ago now while doing a Gillespie show when I literally lost control of a muskie on the floor of the boat one day. I had already been thinking about this was probably, it would happen every so often. Uh, you fish struggle when you lay them down generally, especially when they get blinded in the one eye. And uh, sometimes even, you know, guys like me that are good at it and professionals, uh, Hey, they're tough. They thrash at the wrong time and they get loose on the floor of the boat. Obviously, that's a horrible thing. So now we've gone from a period of time where 20 years ago it was pretty much all water measure or not measuring at all, just estimating. And now we're at a time where it's it's basically, you know, 90 some percent of the people seem to be buying a bump board with their first rod and reel when they get into this because the vast majority of, of guides and influencers, whatever you want to call them, are doing it. And that's what they think is part of muskie fishing. And the problem is, very simply, it doesn't mean anybody's a bad person, but especially people that are very unfamiliar, Scott mentioned earlier about figuring out how to cut hooks and all of the different things that go with handling fish, Somebody that has very little experience handling fish is certainly going to be more apt to lose total control of the fish inside the boat. That same bump board over the side of the boat in the water or a fish sitting in a cradle and a floating ruler next to it. That's a much safer way for the fish and frankly the angler too uh, to handle that fish. And then the other big thing of course is, is uh, water temperature. You take that combination of basically 100% in boat measuring use and water temperatures above 70 degrees and you've got a you've got a pretty lethal situation there. So we've we've gone to overall poor handling and more handling out of the water because of social media. People want exact measurements. They want 50,000 pictures because they get the most likes on the they're grabbing grin and they gotta try and get a million pictures doing that. Sometimes people are handing fish back and forth. And I'll say this guide set a horrible example in some degree with this because I'll see the exact same fish where a guide is holding it separately. And then the client's holding it with the guide standing next to the, you know, this is multiple handling and worse yet, it's setting that example. When you, as a guide, use a bump board all the time and you do these different things, your clients are going to do what you do. Uh, that's, that's where it's huge to, if, if you know how to properly cut hooks and you actually teach people these different things and important things about handling that are actually going to save fish, that's a, a huge example you're setting. But if you, just, if you just do things, basically whatever you're doing your clients are going to go do, and you should keep that in mind all the time. But yeah, this this combination of overhandling and the technology, it's it's scary to me, it really is. Boy, feels I tell you, that, that bump board sees so little use in my life that it's a tough discussion for me. I, I absolutely dislike laying a fish down on its side. It's slime as it's slime. It deserves to be on the fish. I don't care if you dip that thing in the water or not. Go ahead and try to convince me you're not removing slime on it. I've seen a lot of stuff recently, especially from some uh, newer anglers in the sport. Didn't want to drop that extra money on that nice bump board. 
using these little thin bump boards They're about this wide. They got a little bump on the end. They lay them down on that boat carpet. And I'm seeing picture after picture after picture of fish laid down on carpet. There's nothing you can do to kill a muskie any quicker than take all the slime off one whole side of its body. We've all caught them after they've been laid on the carpet, big pink infection down inside. I'm not gonna name names, but I'm gonna look right at the director of the PMTT right now and point right at you, man. Measuring 30 inch fish across the country for tournament sake is the worst example I can ever imagine a bunch of guys who call themselves professional musky anglers going out and bump boarding 30 inch fish, and especially here in my home area on 50 inch water. Not only do I disagree, that's just not ethical. That's a year and a half to two year old juvenile fingerling that you already went out and targeted for tournament purposes for God's sake. Disgusting. I mean, can't imagine my clients if I told them we were going out targeting 30 inch fish for the day and what the reaction would be. The idea that these guys go out on this big professional trail and think it's okay to lay these fish down as an example for everybody and that's a lot of big names. Maybe we need to always look back at um, where like you were saying, how the general public acts in this sport is a lot of times led by example from the people that they see in front of them publicly. And there's no larger group of guys that's more public and has more namesake than the PMTT. Which, just to transition out of that real quick since we're there and we're talking about this forward facing sonar and what that all means and the least handling and whatnot there too, I, I think that's something that we need to come back to again as well and ask ourselves why it is that that particular group of guys is bump boarding 30 inch fish but saw fit to remove the FFS from tournament angling. Seems to me that there's an oh, idea yeah. that they're trying to protect their musky fishing there at the same time that they're not doing much to protect their musky fishing. Um, and yeah, we do need you guys that play on the trail to lead by example. You guys are some of the most prominent guys out there in social media. You got some of the biggest names, some of the biggest voices. I guide some of you guys. I love you guys. Great bunch of guys. A lot of them are. But once you enter into that arena and you sign up for measuring 30 inch fish, you sign up for measuring 30 inch fish. I'm not sure how the DNR actually allows this excessive handling of these fish in these tournaments. Um, you know, you're supposed to have a legal fish to come out of the water and do anything with, as far as my knowledge goes, but to take that fish out, spend tournament time measuring it, witness boats, judge boats in some cases. It all comes back to what we need to worry about the most these days. And with declining stocking dollars, every time we come around through the budget cycle and less and less fish going in per acre every other year, these discussions have to be had if we want a future for musky angling yeah. in our region. They have to be had. Well, they are tough discussions. And by the way, I don't know if you know that, Scott, with, with regard to the, there are tournaments run, and certainly the PMTT could do it and anybody could do it. First I heard of it was on Lake of the Woods a few years ago because, you know, they have the 54 inch size limits up there. And technically, you bring that fish in the boat and lay it on a board. That's in your possession. So they're running mm -hmm. the tournaments up there over the side of the boat. They're still using bump boards or some measuring device in most cases, but they are not allowed to bring those fish in the boat. And they still manage to run a tournament and document the fish. So it's not like these are impossible things. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've heard, it was interesting. I fished with a couple of guys that were involved in the tournament exactly that. They'd never had it happen before. And they literally told me, like as they boat talk, the, the way people really talk in the boat, they literally complained on one hand and basically said it was a pain in the ass to measure them in the water on the bump board a little bit compared to being in the boat. But they also said, because they did well in that tournament, I think, they, I think they put about six fish in the net, those fish released a lot better. So on, on one hand, they're literally admitting to me that they didn't really like it from convenience wise, mm -hmm. but the fish took off so much better. And that's the one obvious thing with all of this. I, you know, I, I, I actually, I get most upset when I know people are basically lying to me. Like I've actually had some people when I get in this bump board discussion that literally say, well, I've never had a problem ever with my muskies and I've never heard a muskie because of a, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I don't just want to flat out call you a liar, but you either are a liar 
or you've not caught many muskies mm -hmm. <laughs> in the mm -hmm. boat because it's just that simple and uh yeah the the fish tell you the story you know when you're having a bad release anybody that argues about hot water being a problem isn't paying any attention to their fish because you can take the exact same fish with the exact same fight time and the exact same release time to get the hooks out and all of that and release it in 40 degree water having it out of the water for three minutes and that same fish in 75 degree water having it out of the water for 10 seconds and i'll give this one a better survival rating at the three minutes in the cold water all of these things add up and and are are quite obvious and uh you know but when when you see fish that aren't swimming away well there's a reason for that they're not happy absolutely. they're not healthy absolutely um you know i fish the pmtt and and one of the things i can say that all the guys out there and scott actually kind of said it best and these guys do they do care about the fish 100 percent. and i think that is i fished the pmtt for many many years and i think um if, if anything those guys are handling the fish really well i get that we have to uh advocate the best that we can for the fish but i mean one of the things that i'd like to say too is that we all have to be honest we're out there sticking hooks in a fish's face for sport so it, you know where do we draw the line with all of it you know it's we go out there we have fun i mean and that's really what a lot of it too is about is about having fun we got people that we work for that have fun the people that you hire that's what they come for they want to have fun so i go a little bit on the i get where pete's coming from he's actually changed me a little bit on I bump a lot less fish. I, you know, and the ones I was just telling Pete the other day, the ones that we probably should, shouldn't be bumping the biggest fish, that's the ones we're gonna bump. So, it does, um, it it does, does kind of work, work a little bit backwards. Sometimes. And um, <laughs> like we said, guys, it's, it's all about education. We're trying to educate you guys. And it is a big important thing about being responsible with the fish. That's the most important thing. Uh, like Pete said, uh, you, the fish is gonna let you know what's best for that fish. And when it's cold, the cold part, time of the year, um, you know, for new guys coming into the sport, you got a little more time that time of the year when they're out of the water. The guys that fish them like Pete, I, Scott, all the time understand that. And we get to do that every day. So. We also want to educate the guys that are new coming into this sport and, and, you know, let that fish tell you. And like Scott said before, there's there's a learning time there to do that. And so you only got so much time and, and so many of these fishing we can, you know, it's, it's really important to get them back in the water as fast as possible. You know, we've got to kind of stay on the topic of forward-facing sonar. And, and Scott made a good point before. Um, we're seeing one of the things I kind of disagree with on the forward facing sonar myself as an angler is the whole um, pegging them out of deep water. I mean, that, to me, that is pretty unethical. That's I mean, it's, horrible. it's horrible to me. It, it, it's it, these guys are getting big giant fish. I, I, I have to say that I've seen the, the technology and works and I at times I think it is a tool and I don't think it's the worst. I think it's in some cases I, I like it, but um, and I've used it um, very very little. I got to get in a boat with a young guy that was really good with it, and um, it, it wasn't easy to learn. I mean, you got to learn it. And but I think what speaking of what Scott said, and I'm gonna let Scott talk about that. I think that's a real important topic about the, taking these fish out of the deep water and those are probably the easiest ones to target in this whole situation. You know, and, and, and Pete was talking about temperature and the importance of uh, quick release at any point, but especially how negative those upper ranges of the 70 degree mark pushing 80 can be on these fish. They're just not made for those high temperatures. And if I go back to the summer of 2020, year COVID, where the Canadian border was shut down and we picked up this just tremendous, tremendous amount 
of excessive musky fishing pressure on our little puddles around here. Um, Airbnbs exploded. That whole market took off like crazy. We've never seen anything, anything like that happen to our waters. But I, 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 as I watched it unfold that year, this happened to be the year where our biggest, deepest lake in the region at five and a half thousand acres, just over 90 feet, settled in at 84 to 85 degrees for six straight weeks that summer of 2020. Now everybody booked their cabins, everybody was supposed to go to Canada, was scrambling to come up with places to go. And I saw our big clear lakes take the burden of the pressure because most of these guys coming from Eagle, Million Acre Lake of the Woods, where have you, they're not interested in setting up on our 300 to 700 acre lakes. The, the bays that they launch out of are larger than that. They just, that wasn't what they wanted to adapt to from fishing a lifetime in Canada. Now, most of these guys, family trips, you know, whatever they might be, whether it's hardcore musky guys going to the woods or it's just families going to Lake of the Woods like they do, or Eagle, they go up, they might fish muskies 10, 12 hours while they're focused on smallmouth and walleye the rest of the time. Great people coming down to Wisconsin, bringing their tourism dollars. We're gonna embrace this and welcome them. The problem was is that most of these people are up there lifetimers and not being privileged to our kind of semi-psychotic inner circle of musky people like we are, Many, if not most of these people who are new to our region had never heard mention of 80 degree water temperature dangers for these fish. Lake of the Woods, Eagle, these waters never, if they ever do, I heard recently, they heard maybe this year, top 80, but 80 degrees, what I'm saying has never been a problem for them or a concern even in their wheelhouse from previous musky fish fishing experiences. So they show up here and whether they bounced off or contacted someone like you or I who said, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing that which of course always comes off as preachy to anyone who right. hasn't been told about the dangers of warm water. So we saw all this warm water fishing going on and we have continued to see that. Other than this last season, we had three years in a row where our water just boiled here across the board. We were fishing Lake Superior for trout and salmon and we had over 80 degrees on Lake Superior for goodness sake. That's just setting the stage back to the forward facing sonar and the, the release going on here. What I have witnessed is we've had more heat, fish settle into that column further out and deeper. And anybody who knows me knows I've played open water for 25 years. It was my go-to early. I tried to figure out where did those big fish go in the end of June when they just disappeared from the casting scene. But now with the ability to go out into that giant haystack and look and just find those needles, I warn my clients know from experience, it doesn't matter how good that open water suspended bite is, once those arcs get below 18 or 20, that lake is done for me for the rest of the summer period. Doesn't matter what surface temps are. When your fish start descending below 20, you're gonna blow air bladders. I don't care how good you think you are. You can run shallow baits over that fish. If it jumps hard from 12, 15 feet and contacts you, it's still gonna throw the bladder into the chest cavity and you're gonna have an upside down fish swimming. You're gonna be calling every friend you have, trying to figure out how to get it to release. This technology, I went from seeing basins without a single fisherman and I'm throwing a musky bait to in the last couple of years, I see people out there when I'm, it's way too hot to be musky fishing. These arcs on these clear lakes aren't 20 down, they're 35 to 50 feet oh, yeah. down and they're being targeted by musky fishermen in the dead of summer, bringing them out of 60 degree water temperatures, maybe even cooler at that depth. I don't care if it's 74, 75, 76 on the top. We've got this like leeway at the top we give each other so that we can keep fishing. In my case, right. yeah. Sometimes I don't like having to be in that 76, 77 degree range. Try to avoid it at all cost. But the point is, you'll never catch me targeting deep fish during hot water scenarios. And it's become increasingly popular as a technique. Um, I'll come back to what you were talking about. Maybe the greatest evil in all of this is that little blue thumb everybody seems to need that gratification of recognition. It doesn't matter what the cost at the end may be for some of these people. It's like you said, I can't push the fish out real far today, but it's that it's that <laughs> grin and grab. Got another 32 incher here for the bump board. Make sure you <laughs> shove it out. But the point being again, that we as an angling community have always monitored each other to an extent to make sure we're doing what the contemporary best suggested handling is for good release. You've always been at the forefront. I think back to how many people out there can say they owned not just one, but two quick cradles. I thought you were onto something with that thing. <laughs> sure. And it was, and it was, it was really close. But the idea being that as we move forward, we should become better at handling techniques. As a community, we should holistically 
be agreeing that some things are maybe going too far and we're handling too much. And, and we have discussions about how to kind of come back together on the same page. Um, I've always been a big proponent of no standing with the muskies when you come out of the net. Because I watched one person drop one on the side of the gunnel and crush its head one time and it, and it died. And since oh. then I've been having every client, I've got a few clients and uh, my, my missus doesn't come out and take a knee real easy because of some knee problems. But otherwise, certain things. And I've seen that, that knee hold has become more popular over the last couple of years. Um, but in the end, when we're talking about 20 to 25 years to get to a trophy fish, it takes the entire community of anglers out there sharing the same water to all, all do their best, all do their utmost. You know, I talk about not using the bump board much from a guiding perspective. I hate put, putting fish on that board and like Dave referenced, oddly enough, it's our biggest ones that we put down on that board because we want to see, oh, did it break that little red line? So important to break that red line. Right. Thanks, Malax. Um, nobody cared about what a 50 inch fish meant until everybody went and caught one on a bucktail in one year. All of a sudden 50 became a big deal. Um, uh, I, I really think it's the dirtiest word in musky fishing. 50 really has become. It's too much focus on it. Sure is, sure. sure is. It's become the dirty word. You're not cool unless you're in that club, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So. I will definitely take a fat 48 over a skinny 51 any day, but it's all the experience. That's the whole thing. I think it, uh, when, when it all boils down to the quarter of the inch in the, in, in the girth, it's, that's what's weird about it. You don't hear, seems weird to me. People don't tell the story of the day and the actual catch as much as they want to tell you the exact length and girth and what they think the damn thing weighed. It's like, to me, that's nothing. Mm -hmm. Who cares if you're within an inch or what? I mean, to me, it was, you know, did you, did you bust your hinder all day and then, you know, something, hey, you, you figured something out or the weather came in and the fish went, whatever it might be, that's the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. That's that's the kind of stuff you talk about over a beer. That I, I don't know, it's just, to me, you know, that, that, that focus has really gone the wrong way. But I guess what I, what I want to stick on, I know we've been rambling a long time, and, and you and I, I, I can tell, could ramble a lot mm -hmm. longer. Mm -hmm. Can these, can the fisheries handle it? That's, that's seriously my biggest concern. And frankly, I'll say this, don't think of it, you know, because, uh, you know, Scott and I are good guys and we're worried about things. Let's, Let's be real and think of it selfishly. Absolutely, I am. I am more than tired the last couple of years, and it's. It, and I'm not going to attribute it to anything other than the forward-facing sonar. We've talked about this. I am tired of having to teach my clients high-pressure cold front techniques under optimum conditions because <laughs> the fish are so highly pressured on these small lakes that yep. if you aren't zigzagging with a dart in between left-right glide bait guy, and you better be Yoda on that glide bait, you can't get the juvenile fish to respond anymore, let alone some of the giants that we all want so desperately. So do I Do I see the technology having that negative impact already? Sure, and you you know, you know see it in the laundry list of excuses that even come from the people that are on the pro side for the FFS. Oh, it doesn't mean you can make them eat. No, but it means you can cast directly at that fish's face a thousand times with 500 different baits if right. you want to and judge your style of retrieve and triggering going on every single inch of the way. Again, that is a video game to me that's not even conceptually fishing to me. When I hear the stories from clients who, let's just use Green Bay as an example, and they go out with a guide and they show up on my boat two days after they're out there and they're like, oh, I was out with so-and-so, we saw 19 fish. Wow, no kidding, that's a great day. What, what do you think the biggest was? Oh, I, I don't know, they, they were all out on side and none of them actually followed. Right. So now we've gone so far as these guys who are professional anglers, you know who you are, are referring to fish on the screen at 40 yards from the side of the boat as encounters for their clients for the day. I used to have to have that fish at least make it within visual range before I counted seeing it for the day. <laughs> right. That was um, more fun. But now, as long as you know it was there, some of the, I'm going to use the word sleazy. Some of the sleaziest usage I've heard out of this tool so far 
are the people on fisheries where it's a very popular technique, whether we go to some of the Minnesota fisheries or Green Bay, who hang on the outskirts and watch the guides beat up on a fish for a half hour, 45 minutes, because they know if that guide's gonna stop there and beat that long, it's gotta be a giant. When the guide pulls off that mark, they just come right in on that fish that they were on there with their FFS, spending all that time casting at. As soon as that guide moves off, John Q. Public comes over and drops his forward facing sonar on it. And then they brag when it goes in the bank. This has become, again, I'm not sure. Uh, these are people who used to fish the way we're talking about that we enjoy, that element of surprise, the hunt. The learning of fishery, not just looking at a mark on the screen and going, oh, there it is. Oh, I caught 254s on back-to-back -back casts. I mean, come on. Do you sleep at night or you just stare yourself in the mirror and question your integrity at that point? I don't personally understand where there'd be any pleasure in it. And I'm, a, I'm not going to lie. From a guiding perspective, and I know there's clients out there who think it's cool, but it comes back to that central problem that we're talking about again. If you're cool with going out and throwing 20 casts at seven marks on a screen all day so you can stand there and brag, I don't know if you were really in this for the right reason to begin with. You're nothing, that's nothing but the grin and grab. You're not fishing. You're not a musky angler by any means in my mind. You're there for a grin and grab. And you want somebody to drive you around to accomplish it. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm not acquiring any client base who are looking for forward facing sonar. I refuse to turn on side imaging in my boat, for God's sakes. I won't use it. I watch people around here abuse it on our little bitty lakes the way it is. So for me, the hunt is the hunt. I teach my people about locating fish, triggering fish, and adapting to different styles of water as they go out on their own time so they can enjoy fishing better. But staring at the video game, again, you might as well sit home with the laptop and watch somebody else go out and forward facing sonar fish on YouTube, because there's no shortage of that these days, because I can't imagine much more fun than watching somebody else do it, really. I mean, huh? I just don't understand it at, at all on that basic level, even Pete. I just, it's not even fishing to me, so. We've so covered, where were we? we? We've covered a lot. We have, yeah. We've yeah. covered a lot, and ethically, you know, uh, it's it's down to your preference, really. I mean. We, we we do agree with Scott on a lot of the things. Um, you know, he's hardcore on this this part of it, and all of us really are in it for that excitement. That is the part of it that's really fun, and what it, what drew all of us to this is the excitement, and that's that's what we that's why we got into it. I mean, the 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 new guys. I don't know like what Scott's saying, um, what their reasoning for it is. Is maybe some looks on. And some thumbs on social media but you know there is a tool aspect to it too we want to tell you that there is a tool aspect to it and it's it's how you use it as an angler I guess and, and there we go back to the ethics part of it and and you yourself are gonna to have to determine how you want to use that that technology and um, you know I, I do know a couple guys that use it in a manner that I feel that will not use it to target deep water fish and they use it for structure and stuff like that because it is a pretty cool tool for that but well, again yeah point. yeah it's a real big point and i think the, the biggest thing is like like we all want to do we want to educate you guys again you know um scott myself uh pete we've we've all done this for many many years we've come up like i said pete was throwing buoys at these things uh, on bars and scott and i Not probably heard them Dave. no scott and i came <laughs> up at the, the the end part of that and we started to get into the more electronics and some gps type stuff and uh, we use that every day. We love it. I mean, if we go on a new body of water, we're going to use our electronics and our GPS just like everybody else. So we're all, you know, we use that stuff. If we go to Canada, we're going to put the proper chip in to use that. And so, you know, you got to use your electronics in a manner in which it suits the best, the best uh, scenario. Yeah. And so I think with all of that said, I mean, I think we're going to probably start wrapping it up here. And uh, anything else you guys yeah. want to say? I would just say finally for myself, I, I can, uh, I, I basically agree with Scott 100% on, you know, I, I think real fishing would be 
I don't know, more more exciting and real fishing with without extreme tools. Uh, I do I, I do have a soft spot for young people, especially if they're just get, getting started in a guide business or whatever. I, I think to some degree they almost get get forced, whether some of it's ego or from a business standpoint, to uh, use some of this stuff. So I. I'm pretty forgiving. Uh, I don't really look down on the people that use it for the most part, unless they're unethical. Now, this whole this whole deep water thing, warm water thing, anybody that is using forward-facing sonar to target these fish in open water, warm water, with the combination of deep, you are. I don't want to say the word what I really think, but that's horrible. I, you know. I have I have nothing but bad to say for you. I hope your boat sinks. Uh, it's that's just horrible stuff. Uh, but I think uh, you know we possibly one solution. I know we haven't talked about this yet, but to some degree, and maybe Northern Wisconsin would be a good place to do it. It'd be interesting to see because we have seen the effects of it. I think to a certain extent, we don't get the amount of did, uh, visual follows. And different things. I, I don't know how much of it is the fish education and how much of it is the uh, fish dying, whatever it might be, but uh, I would love to see some lake situations where people couldn't use all the electronics, could not use forward-facing sonars. Now granted it's going to take a few years before you'd ever have any, you know, real strong evidence, but I think you would see the fish reaction evidence pretty quickly. Uh, as to whether or not they would be, you know, totally, you know, used to the forward-facing sonar. It seems like they are now, and they won't follow. They won't, they won't do anything because they get pounded by lures. But it, it, it's an idea to at least try and get somewhere with this. As, as much as maybe I would or Scott would like to have it all go away, it's, it, it's not gonna. So, you know, to me, we gotta, we, we gotta definitely Tell everybody to be careful. Get more serious about handling. I think that's a no-brainer. And then, uh, you know, maybe through having some bodies of water where we don't allow it at all uh, would be helpful to give us an idea of how much of a change it's actually making on the fisheries. One of the things, Pete, I think I'd like to say real quick is that we know we're probably going to get hit up with a whole bunch of questions on this. and Probably uh, going to get beat over the head. And we'll get beat over the head a little bit, but keep it clean, guys. That's all we ask. And um, we want to bring more topics to you like this and some, some good educational debate. And... Um, Pete, can they subscribe to our channel? Is that how that works? Oh, God, yeah. The, uh, subscribe. You're supposed to subscribe and ring the bells and notifications and all that different stuff. Tell all your friends, even your friends you don't like, uh, that they should do that as well. And we really appreciate Scott being here with us I, today. So if anybody needs to get a hold of you, because they're probably... You are, uh, I would have to say, he is one of the most hardcore guys in Wisconsin who has caught so many big fish, and uh, he's done it his way. That's the main thing. He's done it his way, and... Uh, yeah, I kind of like that about yeah, him. Yeah, I do <laughs> like that, too. So, um, Scott, how do they get a hold of you if they need to get a hold of you? Uh, they can get a hold of me through a uh, Facebook app or on Messenger there or through social media. That's probably the best way. I got a full boat right now trying to slip one or two new clients into the calendar a year We've got such a great crew there but yeah if you're looking to get out learn uh, something about these big green monsters in northern wisconsin i don't leave the 715 that's the one thing about me everybody knows i don't cross the border for a muskie i don't go to any other bodies of water than what i got here in a four county radius i love northwest wisconsin muskies well with that pete are you gonna roll out of here or are we uh or you're going to get a roll out of here. <laughs> well, you guys are here. Yeah, I got a mate. But I do, now look at this beautiful face right here. I do need to get the dogs for a walk before it gets dark. So you guys are going to have to get the hell out of here soon. Yeah, because right, I got to so do that. We'll see you guys later, and thanks for having us.